Hello, and welcome to the Alliance for Democracy's The Populist Dialogues. Our program promotes progressive, populist perspectives on the issues of the day. The Alliance for Democracy is dedicated to establishing true democracy and creating a just society based on an equitable, sustainable economy. Tensions have been rising between the United States and North Korea ever since Donald Trump became president even to the point of the president dispatching a U.S. aircraft carrier and other supporting uh, warships to be stationed in the Sea of Japan. Joining us today to make some sense of all this is Martin Hart Landsberg, Professor Emeritus of Economics at uh, Lewis and Clark College and Board Director of the Korea Tra uh, Policy Institute. So uh, Marty's been on our program before. We're very happy to welcome you back. Thank you. I'm pleased to be here. Yeah. yeah. So um, you've written a couple of books about mm -hmm. Korea. Talk, tell us what the names are and, and just the general thrust of the, of the books. Well, one that's probably most relevant for this is called um, uh, um, Korea Division and Reunification and U.S. Foreign Policy. Uh, a lot of people don't really know that the U.S. has played a huge role in both the division of Korea and the struggle of Koreans to, to uh, have peaceful reunification. So the book for me was really a chance to learn and to try and explain some of that history and some of that responsibility and some of the challenges. And then I've written two books on South Korea, uh, its economy and politics. One is called Rush to Development, and the other is Korea in the Global Economy, a Marxist perspective. Hmm. Okay, all right, well those sound, those sound interesting. Yeah, <laughs> I'll, I'll have to pick them up and and uh, read them. So uh, recently you, you have a blog called uh, Econo um, Reports from the Economic Front. Right, okay, right. A and, and recently you had a, a report there called the, the Need for a New U.S. Foreign Policy Toward North Korea. So before we talk about what the new mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. policy looks like, let's talk about what the old policy looks like. Well, and, or, and or the existing policy. Yes, and here I wanted to go back to your introduction. Um, because it is true that since Trump has been president, there was, there was sort of a push towards war, which seems to have kind of died down a little bit now as mm -hmm. other issues have, have become more important. But it was almost reported as if this was something brand new. But yes. And I, I guess the, the long and short of it is that the U.S. and North Korea have remained at a state of war since the Korean War. I, I don't know how many people realize that the Korean War just had an armistice which stopped the fighting but there was never a peace treaty signed ending the Korean War. So the war, in a sense, remains um, unconcluded, and U.S.-North Korean relations have, have always been very tense. Um, the, um, up until, I would say, the early 90s, neither side was really particularly interested in engaging the other side. Um, the U.S beginning in 1958, brought nuclear weapons onto the Korean Peninsula in violation of the Armistice Agreement, uh, threatened the North Korea with, with nuclear attack long before North Korea ever had nuclear weapons. Uh, in the 1970s, the U.S. began war games with South Korean troops and then eventually even Japanese, um, simulating uh, both a repulse of, of a North Korean attack or, or, or an actually offensive attack in, into North Korea. So there's been... I guess a, a steady buildup of the U.S. threatening the North and then over time the North responding by threatening mm -hmm. to launch strikes on, on U.S. bases yeah. in the South or Japan and the United States. So it, it's been an ever escalating set of, of threats and counter threats. Yeah, and, and, and most certainly if uh, Mexico were to uh, uh, have a military partner other than the United States mm -hmm. uh, that uh, was uh, doing military exercises on our southern border, mm -hmm. uh, we would probably react very strongly against that. Mm -hmm. uh, and so uh, I, I presume that uh, North Korea has had similar kind of negative reactions. Yeah, I mean, one of the things that, that's presented in, in the media, and of course, people know very little about North Korea, so almost any, and I'm not even sure, and I think it's fair to say they're not always their best advocates themselves. Mm -hmm. um, but there's a sense that North Korea is just this militaristic state uh, with leaders who are maybe embracing war. Um, and, and I think a lot of that is just not borne out by, by, by history. Um, 
The South Koreans have outspent the North Koreans on military spending every year since 1976. Um, in most cases, the North has been reacting to the fact that it faces an economically and militarily superior South and the United States, and that it's lost the protection of the Soviet Union, which doesn't exist anymore. Mm -hmm. it, the um, international agencies that actually measure military spending um, said as of 2016, the total North Korean military budget was $4 billion. South Korea is $40 billion. And then, of course, you have U.S. support for South Korea. And North Korea does not have any ally in a military alliance like the former Soviet Union. That's okay. not China. That's not Russia. So for the North Koreans, what you hear is that they spend a huge percentage of their budget on the military, which is true. They have a small gross domestic product, and they have no big powers protecting them. So they spend a lot of their budget on the military, but the actual size of their military, leaving aside the number of people they have, what they actually spend, the actual amount, is very small. And almost all of their missile tests, um, they've launched, uh, exploded five nuclear bombs, uh, 2006, 2009, 2013, and two of them in 2016, have come in response to either threats or what they have felt, and I think the evidence suggests, are uh, a lack of good faith bargaining on the, on the part of the U.S. So I think if you understand a little bit of the history of what's happening, and you can see that the North has been essentially the weaker party, um, has been responding to big military builds up by the South and the U.S., the loss of a partner, and the fact that, that a war still goes on, um, it, it paints a very different picture of, of what's happening. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, and, and part of that picture uh, that Americans would usually have is that uh, it's an extremely impoverished nation, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, most people are starving. Uh, is that uh, an accurate uh, portrayal, or, or uh, partially so? Or well, to, to a considerable extent, it is. But then again, we need to sort of talk about why. And I yes. think this is how it fits into this. U.S. foreign policy issue. Until about the mid-70s, North Korea actually was doing better than South Korea economically, hmm. even according to the U.S. CIA. And beginning in the mid to late 70s, the South Koreans really started to move ahead. Um, North Korea began because of U.S.-China differences, uh, excuse me, Soviet Union Chinese um, uh, um, differences over who was really the leader of the communist world. The North refused to take sides, and so both sides kind of abandoned them, mm. and that meant a, a loss of aid, and so the North began to slip away, uh, slip behind the South. Um, what was really the key turning point is when the Soviet Union ended, and, the, and Russia and the Central European economies, who used to be part of the Soviet orbit, all became capitalist and, and market, they left the North Korean economy in a very vulnerable place because the North Korean economy was a planned economy. It sold goods to the Soviet Union and other East Central European countries and imported them on a, on a barter, a managed trade basis. And once those countries no longer were planned economies but were market economies, they didn't want the North Koreans' goods. Mm -hmm. And so the North Koreans couldn't afford any oil. They couldn't afford um, fertilizer. They couldn't afford a lot of things they needed, parts, to, to, to maintain their economy. So beginning in the late 80s, early 90s, their economy started to slide. They had a number of bad um, harvests because of, of huge floods. And ever since the 90s, their economic situation has gotten very bad. And this is why it's very important to understand that beginning in the early 90s, the North Koreans suddenly wanted for that very reason, a different relationship with the United States. Mm -hmm. They understood that without reconnecting to the global economy, the future of their economy was going to be very bad. Um, so what they began to do is to reach out to the United States and say, let's sit down and talk and settle the, the Korean War, sign a peace treaty, let's normalize relations, let's 
make it possible for us to get investment, to join the IMF, to join the World Bank. You know, we talk about North Korea as if it's this hermit kingdom that mm -hmm. it doesn't want to have any talks, it doesn't want to have any connections. And in fact, since the 90s, the North has been trying very hard. The North um, tried to join the IMF and World Bank to get aid. The U.S. and Japan blackballed them. Uh, the North has set up a series of free trade zones trying to attract foreign investment. U.S. and Japan haven't normalized relations. They won't allow any investment. They try and keep other people from, from investing. Um, so what's happened is since the early 90s, the North Koreans recognizing the economic problems have said, we've got to somehow get the United States to sit down with us, talk, settle differences. Everything can be open. And so while since that period, the North Koreans have been eager and open to have those kinds of dialogues, the U.S. has been the exact opposite. They see the North as in a weak, vulnerable situation, and their goal has been to try and essentially destroy the economy, to try and maybe recreate what happened in Germany where the, the South can absorb the North. And so they have done everything they can to keep the North isolated and weak, and it's in response to that policy that the North Koreans have embarked on a nuclear program and a missile program. But at each step of the way, they have said to the U.S., if you will sit down and talk with us about all issues, your concerns and our concerns, we are willing to freeze our nuclear program. At one point, they were willing to actually destroy all their nuclear weapon facilities. Um, they've entered into a number of agreements, attempts to essentially bargain away what they were doing for what was their bigger goal, which was normalization uh, with the United States, an end to the embargo, and an opportunity to rebuild their economy. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, uh, this, this paints a, a, a very, very different picture than what we get in the mainstream American media, for, for certain. Uh, so these embargoes, why, I, I assume that these embargoes that the U.S. has mm -hmm. imposed uh, are a cause for the economic um, disarray in, mm -hmm. in North Korea? Uh, well, they certainly add to it. They add to um, it. Okay. I think that, that the North Korean planning system was, you know, suffered from its own difficulties, but once the Soviet Union ended up, ended, and trade relations ended with, with, a, with Russia and, and Central European economies, the North needed to change. Um, but it it's recognizes, I think correctly, that there's, there's only so much it can do if the U.S maintains a, a hostile embargo and, and threatens it. Mm -hmm. So I don't think the U.S. embargo is, is the primary cause, but at this stage, there's no way for the North to rebuild its economy un, under these conditions. And the U.S. is aware of that. And so I think that, you know, the starting point is, do we really want to risk war? Um, we say, well, we can't, you know, we can't deal with the North because they don't want to talk, when in fact, they very much do want to talk. And it's really the United States that doesn't want to talk. Exactly. Right. The U.S., in fact, refuses any direct negotiations with North Korea. And this didn't start with Donald Trump. This was under Obama and under Clinton. Um, so this has been a, a, a consistent pattern. And, it, and, and this is why some people say, well, it, you know, as long as there's no war, it doesn't matter. Who, who, who cares? Mm -hmm. Well. The situation matters in the following way. There's a squeeze on North Koreans, leading to great uh, social cost, uh, malnutrition, and difficulty. The North Korean economy is starting to grow again, but very slowly. Um, you know, mentioned the economic difficulties. They're real. Um, so there's a huge social cost in North Korea. But to the extent that the U.S. keeps this pressure on uh, the, the warships, the um, the, the, the still annual war games where simulated nuclear f attacks are, are, are practiced, um, what that does is it's actually feeding militarism throughout East Asia. Uh, the Japanese are saying, well, if there's this big a threat, we need to end our peace constitution and have a strong yeah. mm -hmm. militarism. And then the Chinese say, well, if, if the Japanese are militarizing and the U.S. is doing this, we need to beef up our military. And so what it does is it legitimizes a big military budget in the United States, which we don't need. It comes at the expense of social cost. Donald Trump wants to add $50 billion to the military budget cut. The same thing's happening in Japan. The same thing's happening in China. 
North Korea is, is squeezed because of its need for the military. And I don't think people appreciate that in a period of war tension, even if we don't have war, it provides an excuse for governments, whether it's North Korea, South Korea, Japan, China, to suppress democratic rights. Mm -hmm. Because any opposition to the regime can be seen as threatening national security. So w even if we escape a war, the policy has huge costs. And it's a policy of choice. If the U.S. wanted to sit down and say, okay, let, let's talk, let's, let's see what there is, they have a willing partner on the other side. Mm -hmm. and, and it's that option that the U.S. says we don't even want to entertain. Okay. Oh, so how can, uh, how, how can Americans respond to this? Well, I think one of the, the things is to demand. You know, whenever there's been um, polling, um, something like anywhere from 68 to 75, depending on the year, percent of the American people say, we support direct talks. Mm -hmm. And so I think what that means... And, and of course, that, that is at least in part because we assume that they don't. Well, I don't know. I think it's in part a fact that U.S. Pop people say, if there's an opportunity to, to minimize the risk of a war, mm -hmm. why shouldn't we take it? Mm -hmm. Which is a very reasonable it's thing. It's a very reasonable thing. And I think people take that not even knowing much about the history. And I want to get into a little bit more of that, but mm -hmm. I say what people can do, I think, is go, for example, to websites like the Korea Policy Institute that I work with, uh, which is kpolicy.org. There's another great website called zoominkorea.org. And you can see uh, and learn about campaigns that are going on in South Korea that people in the U.S. are trying to support. Um, for example, the U.S. is pushing a missile defense system on South Korean people that they don't want it. And the purpose of that missile defense system is to strengthen the U.S.'s ability to monitor missiles in China and, and Russia, although they claim it's North Korea. The North Koreans don't like it. It adds to tension. Mm -hmm. Th those of us who don't like militarism in the United States should see that there's an option to, you know, with pushing better relations with the North. There's ways to support people in the South. There are campaigns that are going on here that they can learn about and support. Um, there, there's a great um, potential now. I think this is a really important moment because in South Korea, there was a president who was a very conservative, very right-wing president who was impeached. Mm -hmm. And a new president has come into office who wants to establish better relations with North Korea, um, much like previous presidents in South Korea. And so if, if Moon Jae-un, the, the current president of South Korea, can really reach out and make overtures to the North, this will make it harder for the U.S., I think, to press its militarism. And this is a very important time for people in the United States to speak out and say, very simply, writing to Congress people, we want direct talks, no preconditions. We want to see the U.S. sit down with North Korea and talk. Mm -hmm. and, and, and put it all on the table. Uh, and, and lifting the embargoes, I would assume, would be, uh, would be a good starting point. Well, even just talk. Let, just let's, talk. Oh, just let's, start. Let's okay. start direct mm -hmm. conversations. And I think this is where history is important because there's a sense in which the U.S. government says you can't trust North Korea. Mm -hmm. right. So first it's they, they're a hermit kingdom. You can't talk to them. They want to talk. Then it's, they're this huge militarist force when, in fact, their spending is very small and, and it's responsive. And then there's, well, there's no point in talking because they never, they're not honest. Mm -hmm. And this is where I think it's very important to, to know some history. And I'll just jump into it yeah, please. and say the first claim of North Korea having a nuclear program was in the early 90s. And this is, of course, the time when the Soviet Union ended. And the U.S. was also looking around for enemies, how to sustain a military budget. And they claimed that the North Koreans had a, had a nuclear weapons program. North Korea had a very small research nuclear reactor. And the North Koreans said, we don't have any weapons. And the U.S. said, we think you're, you're building nuclear weapons. And the North said, you sit down and talk with us, direct, because now they, they want relations, and we'll let you see everything. And the U.S. said, no, we know you have nuclear weapons and we want to, we want, um, to know, we want to be able to go into your country and see everything. And the North said, as part of full negotiations for, for end to the Korean War, everything on the table. 
And in fact, Bill Clinton was preparing a missile strike on North Korea's nuclear facilities. And the only reason we did not have war is because Jimmy Carter, against the desires of the Clinton administration, flew to Pyongyang, met Kim Il-sung, then the head of North Korea, and negotiated an agreement. Yes. And he was so distrustful of Clinton administration and the militarists that he went on CNN and told everyone that this agreement had been signed so the U.S. could not swallow it and keep it secret. Mm. And what that agreement was, was that the North would freeze its, its nuclear um, reactor, it would um, bring in the International Atomic Energy Association to look at all the nuclear fuel, and in exchange, the U.S. would provide it some aid, would provide it with some light water and nuclear reactors for electricity that couldn't be used for militarism, and would move towards normalizing relations. Mm -hmm. And the North Koreans froze their um, nuclear program, allowed their nuclear fuel to be under international expen expansion from 1994 to 2002. The U.S. did not meet its obligations. It stopped sending fuel. Two reactors were supposed to be built by 2003. The cement foundations for one was finally laid in 2002. Hmm. And if you remember, in 2002, George Bush said North Korea's axis of evil. And in 2002, it canceled this agreement. Oh. And this was um, for the North Koreans, who had actually frozen and done all this, waiting for this. It wasn't that the North Koreans were bad negotiating partners, it was the U.S. Mm -hmm. The Chinese became very worried because George Bush wanted to put an embargo and actually seize ships, which would have been an act of war going into North Korea. So they forced the U.S. to come back to the table. And finally, in 2005, there were talks between U.S., North Korea, South Korea, China, Russia, hoping to get everybody together. But the U.S. wouldn't talk directly to the North, so it made it very difficult. Finally, in 2005, the U.S. agreed to a new program, which was almost the same as the first one. You know what happened? The day after the U.S. agreed to the program, which was supposed to be action for action, the North would freeze, the U.S. would provide some aid, the North would begin to tear down, the U.S. would, pr would, would mm -hmm. um, move towards normalization. The very day after that agreement was signed, the U.S. said, the North Korea is counterfeiting $100 bills, and that's an act of war, and so they put on tightened financial um, sanctions. Mm -hmm. This is the same counterfeit bill that the U.S. said had been done by Iran um, <laughs> 10 years earlier, and as a consequence, the North exploded its first atomic weapon. Hmm. And shortly after that, the U.S. came back to the table. And there was an agreement in place from 2007 to 2009. The North actually started to tear down its nuclear facilities, and the U.S. again reneged on its promises, and so the North exploded another nuclear weapon. And this has been the process, that the North is very eager, desperate to get an agreement for its economic pur purposes and for those of its people, and the U.S., whenever it's been forced in back into negotiation, reneges. Mm -hmm. And the North Koreans, rightly or wrongly, figure that they have only one thing which will bring the U.S. to the negotiating table, and that's the U.S. concern about North Korea's ever development of nuclear weapons and missiles. And so these are bargaining chips. Mm -hmm. And so if we really worry about these things, why wouldn't we take seriously North Korean offers to sit down and discuss everything? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, all right. So uh, we're almost at the end of, of the program on, already. Okay. Uh, you have given uh, lots to think about uh, and certainly a different perspective yeah. on, on, this, on this problem. Uh, it, it's really uh, U U.S. militaristic uh, actions that are at the heart of, of the problem. Um, I think so, and, and at a cost to the Korean people and at a cost to American people, and the threat of, of a war. I mean, mm -hmm. it's, it's an insane situation yeah. with such an easy option that uh, could right. be taken. Yeah, yeah. And, and 
tell us again those websites where people might be able to learn more about? Sure. About, first of all, your blog. Okay, first the blog is Reports from the Economic Front. Mm -hmm. um, the two best sites, I think, are the, the site of the Korea Policy Institute, which is kpolicy.org, and another site called Zoom in Korea, all together, .org. Uh, both sites um, regularly produce things that are written by people both in the United States and in South Korea, talking about the, the whole situation on the Korean Peninsula with a particular attention to U.S. policy. Mm -hmm. Okay. And are there any organized uh, groups in the United States uh, that uh, understand the, the, the problem the way you do and that are working to rectify this? Yes, actually both of these, uh, 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 Korea Policy Institute in particular, but people associated with Zoom in Korea are part of networks um, that work for a new U.S. foreign policy and uh, work in coalition with lots of, lots of other groups. And in fact, uh, not so much in, in Portland, but in cities with huge Korean populations uh -huh. like Los Angeles, Philadelphia, Chicago, New York. Um, they're very active trying to build within the Korean community a constituency to force Congress to take seriously um, the possibilities for a different foreign policy. Mm -hmm. Are there, uh, you know, we, we have Senator Merkley and Senator Wyden, mm -hmm. uh, and I particularly think of Senator Merkley mm -hmm. as a, any idea where he's at on, on these kind of issues? You know, I don't. The, the problem that people want, who want a new Korea policy face is that there's very little uh, I don't think people recognize how serious the issue is and mm -hmm. how costly it is. Mm -hmm. And since Korea is no one's favorite, North Korea is no one's favorite uh, country, th there's very little pushback. And that's why I think in many ways if, if we can get the Korean American population more involved, I think their voice could, could become more okay. important. Okay. But I think the more people learn, the, the better off we're going to be. Oh, okay, excellent. Thank you very much for being well, with us. Well, my pleasure. Thank okay. you for the okay. time. All right, good. Thank you. So we've been talking with Martin Hart Landsberg of the uh, Korea Policy Institute and author of the blog, Report from the Economic Front. To read more of Martin's writings, please visit his blog at www.economicfront.wordpress.com. Uh, just an FYI, we do save all of our Populist Dialogues programs to our website. Visit populistdialogues.org to view past programs or when viewing a program to subscribe to our YouTube Populist Dialogues channel to receive notifications of new programs. So thank you for watching. I hope we'll see you again next week. Bye.